There's seven Raiders out there. Now those seven Raiders are in the Hall of Fame. They need a scout, an assistant coach, and a head coach, and a commissioner, general manager, and an owner. And today, they get the best. And he walks down that stadium, crowd cheers, the public address announcer says simply, from the Raiders, Al Davis. He can't be denied. His dream today becomes reality. Al Davis. Thank you, John Madden. As someone pointed out, John Madden was a brilliant coach. He's a loyal friend, a Raider. His record is self-explanatory. His 103 victories in 10 years of head coaching parallels the best in the history of the game. We're all so proud of John. John Madden will take his rightful place in the Hall of Fame in the very near future. We think so much alike that I think he stole my speech, or at least he took most of it last night. I want to thank the Hall of Fame Selection Committee for your tenacity in selecting me to the Hall of Fame. As the great Winston Churchill once said, you never gave in, never gave in, Never, never accept the convictions of honor and courage, and you fought for my selection, as well as another and many numerous media people throughout the country. I shall never forget that. I am grateful to you. The enshrinement is a reflection of a life's work, a reflection of a love affair with the greatest game the world has ever known. But this honor, is a testament to a great organization and to all the capable people who have poured their talent, enthusiasm, loyalty into the greatness of the Raiders and the Raiders' legend and mystique. I was born lucky. I was blessed with a great mother and father. No one had to tell me to love my mother and father based on a commandment. They raised their children with strong discipline and a strong faith in God. Good health throughout my life has been another blessing with many lasting friendships that I treasure with great love and loyalty. My parents wanted me to have the values and virtues of what is still the American way of life. Hard work, dedication, commitment, loyalty, and respect for the dignity of man. I wanted to introduce immediately Today, my mother, Rose, who is here seated in the front row, she's over 90 years old. Thank you. My brother, Jerry, and his family, and of course, my dad, who isn't here, who is a proud guy and a self-starter. I'm sure he is looking down on us today my parents, in their own way, encouraged me to dominate. I tell you this quick story in Florida. It was about six years ago. I was seated in a very prominent restaurant with my mother and some of the top people in professional football, some of the top writers, and we were talking about signing of players. And my mother asked me, how are you doing? And I said, I've got problems. I haven't signed Mike Haynes, Todd Christensen, Lester Hayes, and I named two others. And I said, they just want too much money. Her answer was, without them, what kind of team are you going to have? 
Give them the money. You can't take it with you. And I gave them the money. I learned early on in life that if you're going to lead, if you're going to dominate, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, is not necessarily right. You must treat people in a paramilitary situation the way they want to be treated, not the way you want to be treated. To do that, you must learn about them, learn their cultures, and allow for their individual differences. We never wanted our players, or even our friends, to fit into rigid personality molds. There's a place in this world for mavericks, stand up for principle, defy custom at times, be right, do not hurt others. That individualism encouraged me to go forward, and my heroes, my heroes when I was a young boy, dared me to dream. I had come from Brockton, Massachusetts to Brooklyn, New York, over 50 years ago. I was about six years old. We had no TV, little radio, and eight great newspapers. They were my eyes and ears. Pro football had little popularity, but I was immediately inspired by two great organizations at the very young age between six and 12, the New York Yankees and the Brooklyn Dodgers. Let me tell you what the Yankees represented. They represented size, power, dynasty, intimidation, the home run, the ability to take players from other teams and put that Yankee uniform on them and they would play great. The Dodgers of Branch Rickey was speed, the development of young players, fundamentals, a way of playing the game, and the willingness to pioneer. I always thought early on you could take these great qualities of these organizations and encompass them into one. As a famous American said, I had a dream, a dream to someday build and maintain the finest organization in the history of sports, an organization that would be the most imitated, the most respected, and the most feared organization in its field, a standard of excellence by which all others would be judged. A chill went through my body last night as I met with many of the special people who I went to school with, lived with, played with, coached with, coached. And for a few brief moments, I remembered many of the special people who can't be here today. It was well over 50 years ago, as I told you, that I started this long journey in Brooklyn, New York, at Public School 189, Winthrop Junior High School, and a famed Erasmus Hall High School. My boyhood friends, Danny Glassman and Stan Roberts, are here today. From there, I went to Wittenberg College in Springfield, Ohio, and Syracuse University. And we just had a recent reunion of all the great athletes from Syracuse. And here today, Bernie Custis, a great quarterback, my teammate, and Bobby Wallach, a great basketball player. My first job, I was 21 years old at Adelphi College in Garden City, Long Island. Herman Mason, a great magazine writer, gave me a chance to write newspaper and magazine articles that attracted the coaches around the country. I then, at 24 years old, had a team called Fort Belvoir, Virginia. It was a team that fought to be the number one service team in the nation. Last night, seven of the great players were here from that team, and I was certainly honored. I worked in 1954 as a scout for the Baltimore Colts and Weeb Eubank. Then on to the Citadel. And there I had a great player, Angelo Coya, who's with me to this day as a scout for the Raiders. And in 1957, Don Clark, the late Don Clark, a magnificent human being, hired me as an assistant coach at Southern Cal. There I coached two of the greatest players who've ever played this game, Willie Wood, a Hall of Famer, and Ron Mix, a Hall of Famer. Dorothy Clark is here today. I go to 1960, when the American Football League prospers. A new league was formed. I want to tell you, I learned at a very early age, to be great and just win, you need great players. And boy, does that help you win. I joined the Los Angeles Chargers in 1960 and went to work 
for Sid Gilman, who sits on this stage as a Hall of Fame in Shriney. It was like a science laboratory to learn, study by a master. I never thought that anyone could outwork Al Davis. I loved every day of work, looked forward to it, and I have great respect for Sid, and of course his wife Esther, who at that time was to me the standard bearer for football coaches' wives. From the Chargers, the great Lance Allworth, the great Ron Mix, are here today. You know, it was in 1963 that it was on to Oakland. I was 33 years old. I was the head coach, general manager. And I can remember attack, pressure, the vertical game, the bump and run, just win, baby, dominate, commitment to excellence, the famed silver and black, Pro Football's dynamic organization, take what you want, pride and poise, and I could go on and on. The reborn players, the holy roller, the miracles of George Blanda, ghost to the post, the immaculate reception, but time doesn't allow it. I want to pay tribute to the vision of a man such as Ed McGaugh, who was one of the founders of the Raiders, and whose confidence in the destiny of the Raiders and myself never wavered. Two other fine gentlemen are here today, Al Locasal and Ron Wolf, who are with me for over 25 years, masters of detail. George Anderson, our trainer, and Dick Romanski, still with the Raiders, have been with me over 30 years. The Raiders standard bearers, John did it for me. I'd like to do it again because I love him. The indestructible Jim Otto, George Blanda, the greatest clutch player the game has ever known, Willie Brown, the magnificent cornerback, Gene Upshaw, the only player who played in the Super Bowl as a starter in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, Ted Hendricks, the consummate linebacker, Fred Blitnikoff isn't with us today, he's a coach for the Raiders, 14 years, and I don't have to tell you about his artistry, and of course, the magnificent Art Shell, the giant head coach of the Raiders today, and then you take Tom Flores, a star player who coached us to two Super Bowls. You throw in Al Davis, and you've had as diverse a group as you could find in this world. And yet, there was a common bond. They played for the organization. They wanted a win for the organization. They loved their organization. And most of all, they loved each other. In 1966, I became commissioner of the American Football League. I did not want to give up coaching, but our league was in a struggle for survival. The merger came quickly in 1966, and there's no question that pro football has become the most exciting mass entertainment in the history of the world. For a moment, I wish all of you would bear with me. I'd like to talk to the great Raider Warriors who are here today some hundred, and who's some who are no longer with us, but whose memories we cherish. I say to those great Raider warriors, let me take you back a few years to Frank Yule Field, to the Oakland Coliseum, to the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, and have you all individually introduced once again to the roar of the crowd. And we can never forget those great fans. The roar would be deafening to see you all in those silver and black uniforms, to hear the national anthem, relive the moments of the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. To those of us who saw you battle to the top over the last three decades, we will never forget you. You know, Raider football was always emotional. We loved to take those memorable trips throughout the league, and we were hated, we were feared, but we were respected. This community is the cradle of professional football. When our heroes of the past become our legends of the future, and we all know time never really stops for the great ones. It reaches out and wraps them in a cloak of immortality. What a great inspiration to come to this field of dreams every year, to walk through the hall and walk through its exhibits, and to pay tribute to this great class. I know Lem Varney, I used to study him, John Mackey was a favorite of mine, and Junior Riggins, I call him Junior, 
God, how he wanted to play for the Raiders and how I wanted them. But they said, no, not in the American Football Conference. We'll let them go over there to the National Football Conference. And then to the great class, to the great class that sits here behind me, the greatest players who've ever played this game. I've always said that the Raiders, my family, we have a realization that we have a debt to them and we have a debt to each other. And they know that I'll never forget that debt. I want to introduce to you a young lady that I met over 35 years ago. She was just a friend of mine. I was coaching at Fort Belvoir. I came out for a big game one day, and I looked up in the stands. It was a small, like, high school field. We only seated about 10,000 at those games. We were fighting to be the number one service team in the nation. And I look up, and sitting there is Weeb Eubank, who's scouting the game for the pros, and the general of the post. And this girlfriend of mine is sitting with the general and Wee Bubank. I almost died. I got her after the game and I said, what are you doing up there? What are you doing with them? She said, I can handle myself. She said, we were talking football. What do you mean talking football? She said, I was telling them about our players. Where do you know about our players? She said, I was telling them everything I heard you say. With that quality, I knew I was stuck. I told her at a very early age that the only thing that could take me away from football was life or death. She put me through the test about 12 years ago. Today she's 100%. She's a beautiful lady, my friend Carol Davis. My son, Mark Davis, I'm proud of him, his friendship to me and Caroli, and most of all, his human qualities. And they really believe, and he does, in the dignity of man, and he has a love for people, and I'm proud that he represents me and that I represent him. Names of some people who are here that I have great affection for, great fondness for, that have touched my life, Hank Stram, John Ralston, Joe Alioto, Jack Brooks, Ed McGaw, Bob Albo, Sam Berkovich, Bill Walsh. Their, rings, their names will ring down the corridors of time in my life. Aside from my will to win and my commitment to excellence, I want to read just a few things to you that happened recently that I thought you'd get a kick out of. This gentleman here, Claude Jones, is a famous bank robber. 24 banks that he robbed, but he's also the greatest Raider fan in the world. I just want to read a few words of his to you. The psychologist said that the problems that his led to his crime spree were deep-rooted and more complex than raid of passion gone astray. Though his crimes were trying to seek revenge against everyone who turned on him, the raiders, through it all, remain loyal. I robbed 24 banks. I didn't have anything left, but there was always hope with them. Jones plans to write Raider Onda Alda Davis a letter of apology. I've embarrassed the team, he said. I would tell him that I lost control. It was my fault. I robbed banks to go to Raider games, but the Raiders didn't tell me to rob banks. I should have finished school, got a better job, and made enough money to pay for myself. Jones hopes Davis will understand. I also wish I could hire his lawyers. In the end, he said that my commitment to excellence, this is Jones, my dream when I get out of prison is to go to work for the Raiders. I'd like to do anything for them. I'd like to do anything constructive. The only thing I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do their banking. <laughs> Aside from my will to win, my commitment to excellence, the fire that burns brightest in me, of the great love and enthusiasm that I had and have for the game of football and for everyone and everything connected with it. I love the game, I love the league, I love my team. But more important, I wanted to embellish all of them to agree, never surpassed and seldom have ever equaled. I think that I've known every facet of this game, whether from the inside or outside, whether in collaboration or in opposition when it was necessary, 
I have labored in this vineyard, this cradle, with the objective of making the league itself a working combination of both discipline and freedom. I shall always believe that great people inspire in others the will to be great. To the people of Canton, to the late Bob Snyder, you have inspired me by your receptiveness, your enthusiasm. I shall cherish this honor for the rest of my life. I thank you very much.